great to be here. Uh, Kip, thanks for your kind uh, remarks. Uh, I was a trial lawyer by training, so I love having the opportunity to walk around. I can't sit still. Uh, Kip has been uh, one of my favorite people I've met in this job. People often ask me, you know, we got 92 days till the weekend. Uh, I got a little sign on my uh, desk, and it's not, I, it's not, you know, Muhammad Ali said, don't count the days, make the days count. And uh, we're trying to sprint to the finish line. But I can't help but get a little nostalgic from time to time as we get near the end of the president's uh, term. And people often ask me, uh, you know, Tom, what, what's been the best part of your journey in the Obama administration at the Department of Justice and now at uh, the Department of Labor? And I often, it, it, it starts with the people that you meet. Because in this job, you gotta make house calls. And I've had the privilege of making a lot of house calls. And if you're gonna grow the economy, you got to talk to the job creators, people like Kip, people like all of you in this room. And uh, I meet so many resilient people in this, uh, in, in this job. I meet people like Kip who understand the need uh, to reject false choices. I, I used to work at the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, and now I work here at the Labor Department. And throughout my tenure, one thread that I have seen is the propensity for uh, people to define really important issues through the lens of false choices. I did a lot of work in the police context, for instance, working with police departments that have been torn apart by uh, issues that you read about all too frequently. And all too frequently, we ask the wrong question. Are you on the police's side or are you on the community side? That is a false choice, my friends. Every police officer I've ever worked with has told me that if you don't have the trust of the community, you can't do your job. So we've got to stop asking those false choices. And what I have learned from, from Kip, what I've learned from going to New Belgium Brewery, what I've learned from spending time with Danny Meyer, what I've learned from my colleague Sally Jewell, who sends her regards, and what I've learned from going to the Equitable Food Initiative. I was out at a strawberry farm a month or two ago, and I was there with growers. I was there with um, the United Farm Workers. I was there with a representative from Costco and a representative from Whole Foods. And what they were doing is rejecting false choices. The false choice that suggests that you either take care of your bottom line, or you take care of your worker, or you take care of your customer, or you take care of your supply chain. And one of the reasons I shop at Whole Foods and I get strawberries there is because I like the knowledge that the person who picked those strawberries is getting treated fairly, getting a fair wage, not getting exposed to pesticides in the workplace that could be killer. And so if there's a lesson above anything that I've learned throughout so many of my experiences in government, it starts with that. And, and so I want to start out by really saying thank you to all of you, because I feel like I've gotten an MBA on the job, spending time with y'all. And I've learned so many lessons. And I've learned so many lessons from talking to resilient workers, folks who got kicked to the side of the road. I was with a group of long-term unemployed folks the other day because I've made it a point of sitting down with people who've been out of work for a long time. And the most important lesson I take from those uh, conversations I have is, but for the grace of God could have gone any of us. These were folks who were at the wrong place at the wrong time. They got game. And I'm proud to say that we've been able to help them get back into the game. Uh, and, and, and when I meet these folks and I see their resilience, um, it's inspiring. And, and so what we've seen in our recovery, you know, when, when the president took office, we were hemorrhaging 800,000 jobs a month. You know it because you were living it. You were just trying to survive. And, and, you know, we had seven job seekers for every job opening uh, in the depths of the recession. Unemployment was heading toward 10%. I went to law school because I was bad at math, but, you know, I'd rather be competing with 1.4 job seekers for every job opening. That's what we have now than with uh, seven or eight. And, and what we've seen now is we've made tremendous progress, thanks to all of you. 
And, and, and the unfinished business that I see everywhere I go, I mean, you know, you, you look at the census data that came out a month ago showing that real income of your typical family in 2015 grew by the largest amount that it has grown uh, in, I think, you know, in decades. And the people at the bottom end of the spectrum actually saw the proportionate uh, highest amount of growth. That's, that's good for America because Henry Ford teaches us, you know, consumption. Economics 101, consumption is 70% of GDP. When folks have money in their pockets, they spend it. And that's good for all of you. They go to the container store. They go to Chick-fil-A. They go to Whole Foods. They spend their money. And, and so when I see what's happening, we have an undeniable wind at our back. But we have undeniable unfinished business. And I think, the, I think this conference and the parallel conversations that I have been a part of are all about the most important piece of unfinished business in this economic recovery, which is making sure that the wind at our back results in shared prosperity for everyone and not simply prosperity for a few. And again, I've had, I've had probably eight different meetings in the last four months with various stakeholders, including but not limited to KIPP. And I'm going to get to that in a moment. And all of these meetings uh, have been about the same thing. How do we make capitalism work for everyone? How do we reject these false choices? And, and that is the number one lesson, as I said, that I have learned from the likes of KIPP. Because we understand that when you adopt that stakeholder theory of governance, which is that shareholders are best served when all stakeholders are well served. That is a key to success. And that is lesson number one that I have learned from you. Lesson number two that I have learned from you is that when people work a full-time job in this country, they shouldn't have to get their food from the food pantry. That's the basic premise of the Fair Labor Standards Act. When FDR signed that law, back in the 30s, he said it was the most, second most important piece of legislation after the Social Security Act that has ever been enacted to protect workers. But that crown jewel has lost part of its luster because I meet people all the time. Alicia, who's part of the Fight for 15 movement. I met her in Detroit. She's working three jobs to support her three children. And the night before I met her, she slept in her car. So I meet these businesses who are doing remarkable things. I meet workers who were at the side of the road and are now back on their feet. But for all those workers I meet, I still see the unfinished business day in and day out. And I've learned from you, again, that you know what? When you put your workers at the center of your universe and when you pay them well, you have reduced attrition. You have higher productivity. And I, I speak to folks all the time at business schools because one of the other things I am doing, although I got a law degree, I spend most of my time in business schools because the other exciting thing I see going on is a recognition that the model that you have put in place day in and day out in your jobs is the model of governance that we need to train the next generation about that stakeholder model of governance. We do not have a legal obligation to genuflect at the altar of quarterly earnings. That is a shibboleth. And I'm, I'm, I've been to probably 10 different business schools, and I'm so excited to see that they are starting to teach what you're doing day in and day out. That is real progress, and that is a remarkable thing that's going on. But the, the, the frustration that I feel, and, and this is really, I, I want to get into the conversation and I want to get any questions you have. The frustration that I feel and the unfinished business that I see is I, I have conversations with my friends in the B Corp movement. I have conversations uh, with Kip and others. We had another convening recently and I was talking to um, you know, Wall Street CEOs who have the same understanding. They understand that we need to think more long term. They understand, you know, years ago, you know, stock buybacks 
uh, were illegal. Uh, we have a tax code that often incentivizes perverse behaviors. We have to think about these things. And, and you know, I talked to one Fortune 40 CEO who said, you know, the quarter to quarter earnings vortex is a challenge I must confront all the time. I know I want to think long term, but I have activist investors, one of whom said to me, you know what, I don't care about the long term. I know you say that will make us uh, more profitable in the long term, but I'd rather be rich than right, and I'd rather be rich than right now. Those weren't my words. Those were the words of the activist investors. And so we've got these headwinds. And, and, and the, these headwinds get at the basic question I often wonder about. Because you all have made a compelling case. The question is this. You have made a compelling case that when you adopt the stakeholder model of governance, it's good for the bottom line, it's good for your workers, it's good for your supply chain, it's good for your community. If that's the case, well then, why don't we have a convening of 10,000? Why can't we take this to scale? We're still confronting some undeniable headwinds. And that seems to me to be the unfinished business because I'm not yet prepared. I want to because I'm a, I, my, my, my roots are in the civil rights movement and in labor. And, and I want to call this a movement, but I'm not yet prepared to say this is a movement because we've got more work to do, it seems to me. We've got to figure out how to scale this. We've got to figure out how to answer the most frequently asked question I get from reporters when I evangelize about this. And that question is, Tom, if you're so right, if Kip is so right, if all of these other folks are so right, well then, you know, why are you seemingly the exception and not the rule? And that is the question that I think we have to address. How do we scale this up? What can we do? And, and I, I, if there's another thing I've learned in this job, it's that we have leverage points at the Department of Labor. We have the ability to enforce the law. We have the ability to issue regulations. We have the ability uh, to go to Congress to lobby for different laws. And I'm proud of the work we've done in that. At the same time, I'm fully cognizant of the limitations of what we're able to do. And that is why I have spent so much time using our convening authority. Almost a year ago to the day, the president convened a, a meeting at the White House of business leaders, labor leaders, workers, and others for the purpose of talking about this conversation. And when he spoke last year in the State of the Union, he said, my goal this year is to lift up conscious capitalists businesses who have indeed rejected those false choices. And he has done just that. Because if we're going to build this movement, we've got to make sure we use every leverage point. And it seems to me that one of our fundamental challenges is we don't really have a name for the movement. When I, I go to six different meetings and I hear six different names, what's in a name? I think there's a lot in the name. And I don't propose to have the right name, but if we're going to think about trying to scale this up. And I need your help because you guys are doing it the right way. And, and I think that the unfinished business of shared prosperity depends heavily on our ability to scale what you're doing. And not scale it through uh, legislation, but scale it through building a movement, a diverse, wide-ranging movement. I am firmly of the belief, and this is one of the good news portions of this, as um, Arthur said, this is a nonpartisan issue, or should be a nonpartisan issue. I, I come from an ecumenical family. I'm the youngest of five. We got three Democrats and two Republicans. And you know, when I, when I watched uh, like the Democratic convention and people were saying, oh my, there's a lot of um, uh, fighting, I said, oh, that's Thanksgiving dinner at my house, you know? We sit there and we have pitch battles about politics and this, and then we come together, lock hands, because we have shared values. And I don't think it matters uh, whether you're going to vote for someone, a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent. I think these shared values around um, conscious capitalism and shared prosperity 
cut across ideological lines. If they didn't, we wouldn't have such an eclectic group here. And so we have a tremendous opportunity. You look at the immigration reform, which historically we've been able to get through, and I'm confident we'll get through again. The reason we have been able to get immigration reform passed is because we've been able to build eclectic coalitions. Evangelicals on the right with uh, faith leaders on the left coming together around a common vision. And I think conscious capitalism, or whatever the name is, is a similar uh, uh, opportunity. The other thing we have going for us is that the millennial generation understands what you're doing. I was speaking recently at a conference of the Sport uh, Fitness Industry Association, you know, CEOs of pretty large um, sporting good manufacturers. And a huge part of their conference was about millennials. Uh, not just millennial consumers, but millennial employees. And as you well know, millennial employees wear their values on their sleeves. And that's why when Whole Foods is working with the Equitable Food Initiative, that's a smart thing to do. Because those millennial shoppers want to know that. And they want to know before they go into that company that they might work for. You know, what are your policies on paid leave? What are your policies on inclusion? What do you think of diversity? Do you tolerate it like Brussels sprouts? Or do you embrace it? Like all of the Fortune 500 companies who filed briefs in the Grutter case. You know, that, that case, and now the Fisher case here out of Texas. You know, the, there were more amicus briefs filed in the Grutter case in 2004, the affirmative action case, than any other case at the time in the United States Supreme Court history. And do you know who filed the vast majority of them? Fortune 500 companies, small businesses, because you understand that if you want to compete in a global economy, you need to have a culturally confident, competent and linguistically uh, diverse workforce. So you were at the center of those successes. The United States retired military leaders were at the center of that because they understood that the armed forces for their success must be diverse from top to bottom. So when we have these opportunities with millennials who embrace diversity and who want to wear their values on their sleeve, we have the opportunity to build a movement. And that's what this is about. That's, that's the main reason I wanted to be here, was number one, to say thank you. Because what you're doing day in and day out is remarkable. You're not only enabling your workforce to live a middle class life, but you're providing a remarkable example to America in the process. And, and we need your help. And I would respectfully submit that um, regardless of your, um, you know, where you come from ideologically, I think that government can play a role in helping to uh, catalyze this moment into a movement. Because we have, to, we have leverage points. I predict there will be a very, very robust conversation next year about things like tax reform and infrastructure investment and immigration reform. And those are opportunities to talk about how we make this economy work for everyone, how we address some of the barriers that are preventing this room of 300 from being a room of 30,000. Because I believe that we need to make sure, and, and, and in the conversations I've had individually with folks, uh, you know, as much as I totally understand why you might want to have a visceral reaction to any engagement with Washington, because our politics are broken. There's, there's no getting around that right now. Uh, you know, when, when, when my middle school friend, my, my kids' middle school friends, they don't want to let their kids, you know, watch even debates anymore. Um, you know, that's, that's a bellwether of uh, a politics that needs to be uh, improve. But you know what, folks? You are the gyroscope. And what do I mean by that? Walter Isaacson, 
uh, one of my favorite people, remarkable author. He wrote uh, a biography of a guy named Albert Einstein. And uh, Albert Einstein was a pretty smart cookie, I'm told. And uh, in the 1950s, he wrote a series of letters to his uh, son in the height of the McCarthy era. And uh, his first letter was, what is wrong with this country? You know, I'm watching um, Joe McCarthy do things that, uh, you know, they, they were the reason I fled Nazi Germany. And then you fast forward a year later or so. Uh, Joe McCarthy's been censured and, re and relegated to the dustbin of history, as he should be. And he writes another letter, and he says, you know what? I love this country. It's got this gyroscope. And, and just when you think this gyroscope is spinning out of control, it writes itself. Well, my friends, the gyroscope is not a piece of technology. The gyroscope is you. It's what the president said down in Selma, Alabama a year and a half ago. The most important word in a democracy is that first word in the Constitution, we. The, the, the collective power of we is what was able to make sure that Joe McCarthy became a footnote in American history. We now have a situation where there are a lot of people who are questioning whether capitalism works for them. They're wondering, that basic social covenant in our nation's history, you know, your next generation is going to be better off than us, or as well off. The people I meet in my travels, many of them are questioning that. And I think you all can be the gyroscope, because you have demonstrated that, you know what, low wages and no benefits are not the inevitable product of globalization. They're not structural. That might be my least favorite word in the English language. Because the term structural often gets used in a way that implies that there's nothing we can do. It's, it's, it's like a hurricane. It just sort of happened. The challenges that we're facing are the product of choices that have been made. They're not the product of a hurricane. And I am confident because we have seen business leaders be that gyroscope in the past. I am confident that you all can be that gyroscope in the future. But what we need to do, it seems to me, is I hope that we can figure out a way to execute a, a friendly merger of all of these conversations that are occurring across America, a number of which I've had the privilege of participating in whether it's at the Aspen Institute, whether it's here, whether it's been conversations at the White House, conversations on Wall Street, conversations in the labor movement, they're all about the same thing. How do we build that stakeholder model of governance? And the reason why I'm excited to be here is you've already figured that out, because you're doing it day in and day out. And you're not doing it as an act of social corporate responsibility, you're doing it as an act of enlightened self-interest because you've recognized that the high road is the smart road. You've recognized that it's a false choice to try to say that it's your workers or your bottom line, but you can't do both. And so that's why we need you to be that gyroscope. And, and, and I would respectfully submit that I think there's an important role that uh, government can play, not only to convene, but to be a catalytic force. And I think that next year, we would be making a mistake. And I don't know where I'll be in 93 days. Uh, you know, I hope I'll be vertical. Uh, and, but what I do know is that I believe that if we're going to start to scale and sustain this movement, we've got to recognize opportunities when we see them. We have great opportunities with young people. We have great opportunities born out of the fact that people of so many ideological stripes are in alignment on this issue. We have opportunities that will come together in Washington, and, and we can't simply throw up our hands and say Washington can never work, because then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You've got to be the gyroscope in Washington. You've got to be the gyroscope in state capitals across this country where there are opportunities 
to do things. And you've got to continue to be that gyroscope with each other. Because to me, the, the best ambassadors of this movement, and I, I'm going to call it a movement now, because you all give me confidence with your body language. <laughs> the best ambassadors are not me, and I recognize that. The best ambassadors are you. And what we need is for you to help. I, I, I need your help to tell us, you know, what can we do to be a catalytic force? What can we do to make sure that this isn't just a moment, but it is truly a movement? What can we do to make sure that the gyroscope that is in this room can really right this ship? Because you know what? I really think that you are at the heart of the most important piece of domestic economic unfinished business, which is shared prosperity. You've created it in your culture. You've demonstrated that you can do it. You've made the business case for it. And now let's scale it. And let's scale it together. Because that is how we return our politics to sanity. That's how we build an America that works for everyone. The most important dependent clause in our Constitution is that first one. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union. And so I am asking you, not only in your work building your great business, but I'm asking you to help us um, evangelize, help us take this to scale, so that the Elishas of the world, um, who frankly keep me up at night, um, folks who you know are struggling, so that we can give them hope. And whether they live in urban Detroit or whether they live in McDowell County, West Virginia, we've got to make sure that zip code never determines destiny in this country. That's part of shared prosperity. And all too frequently, that statement, while aspirational, is not reflecting the realities of America, whether it's urban America or rural America or places in between. I'm confident we can get there because we've always been able to tackle every challenge. And, and I think America is crying out again for folks to come together. And that is why I have spent so much time learning from business leaders, humbled by the servant leadership of KIPP, uh, amazed beyond all get out by the reach of things like the Equitable Food Initiative and, and the culture that exists in places like New Belgium Brewery. And I like beer, so I always think about New Belgium Brewery. But we, had, we digress. And so um, I, I hope that we can do this together. And I hope, you know, as you've thought about this, um, it, it's, it's totally understandable that perhaps you may not have thought that um, folks in the government could play a catalytic role. And if there's one and only thing you take away from it, I hope you will um, expand the aperture of your conversation to ask questions about, you know, what can we do uh, to be catalytic? What can we do to incentivize the good practices that result in shared prosperity? What are we currently doing that disincentivizes good practices? Because in my outreach, I hear many. And, and we have opportunities. And, and don't simply, you know, dismiss um, those opportunities, because you know what? Um, that can be a part of this movement building. So thank you so much for the privilege uh, of having me. You, you have um, educated me so much, and uh, I cannot begin uh, to say enough thanks for you, um, uh, Kip. And, and if we have a little bit of time, I'd be happy to take a couple questions or, or comments. So thank you very much.